having me come along with my husband. My husband would come up to Canada and he would come back, especially from this conference. And oh, he would be so excited, tell me all about it, all about all the pastors. He would tell me some of your names and about what you did. And last year, he came home again, all excited. And I said, okay, okay, I'm going next year. I want to see what's going on up there. And I have very much enjoyed meeting a lot of you. Some of you I haven't met yet. Um, my name is Tony Flanders. Now, Tony's kind of a funny name for a girl. Uh, my real name is Tanya. When I was a little girl, I was the only person I knew whose name was Tanya. But my family nicknamed me Tony. And at that time, we had a cereal commercial that had a tiger on it, and it was named Tony Tiger. So if that helps you remember my name, I tell kids I'm Tony Tiger. Of course, I think that's kind of dated. Now, I really love the decorations today. Now, I do want to know this, though. Which one of you wears this? <laughs> Is that yours? Oh, my. I wore some, like, not exactly like that. I think they were about an inch lower. But you are to be congratulated. <laughs> those, those were her wedding shoes. Oh, <laughs> And then, this is one of my favorites, too. <laughs> this is Reba, this is your shoe. I would love it. I would also love it. I'm always, even though I'm not a pastor's wife anymore, I'm always looking for good ideas. And whoever came up with this, this was a good idea. Um, I do want to tell you about myself a little bit. My husband, I'm from Michigan in the States, and my husband was from North Carolina. And he and I met, actually, the very first day of Bible college. We sat next to each other, alphabetically, in chapel. And uh, we were best friends for the first semester. And then three and a half years later, we got married. We were engaged for over two years. And, and uh, I, I am very grateful that God put us together. Uh, to do the work of the ministry and to have a family. Um, we do have three children. My oldest daughter is named Bonnie Foster. She lives down in Deltona, Florida in the state. Her husband is an assistant pastor at that church and they have four children, three girls and a boy. And then I have a middle daughter named Susanna Flanders. Have any of you ever met Susanna Flanders? She's not married, and she works at the Bill Rice Ranch in Tennessee and has a very wonderful life there at the ranch. And then I have a son who is a pastor. He is a pastor uh, near, the, near Flint, Michigan, about 45 minutes south from where we live, and they have five children. And so I, I on Sunday, one of yours, I think, somewhere over here, you had two little kids, two little girls with little bunny rabbits and then a little boy with a little bunny rabbit and some Easter candy. And I went, oh, it's just like my grandkids. So I adopted yours a little bit and pretended they were mine. But I'm really glad you're here. Now, how many of you are like me? I'm a visitor here. How many of you are like me? You're, you're visiting today. Okay, several, yeah, lots of you. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, how many of you go to this church? Raise your hand. All right, okay. Well, I'm just going to go paint the picture here. If you have your Bible with you, if you would open it, please, to Acts chapter 2. Um, I'm going to move from place to place in the Bible today, but if you... If you have a Bible, find 
mind if you don't just listen. And uh, I'm going to talk about a serious subject today. Um, I do speak to ladies a lot, and sometimes we talk about the home and husbands and things like that. But I'm going to talk about something today that applies to everyone, okay? And here's, and it also goes very well with what Brother Van Gelderen taught last night. And I want to ask you this question, and I want you to try to answer it in your mind. Are you a spirit-filled woman? Are you a spirit-filled woman? Now, I have been saved since I was 12 years old. I got saved in a big evangelistic meeting in Jackson, Michigan. The preacher's name was Hyman Appleman. I actually was singing in the choir when I got saved. I loved to sing, but I was not a Christian yet. And when the evangelist began preaching, I realized that I was not even a Christian. And when he gave the invitation at the end of the service, I came down out of the choir to get saved. I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and save me. That was April 3rd, 1960, a long time ago. I was 12 years old. But I grew up, and I would hear this expression about being spirit-filled. And sometimes I would hear people pray, Lord, fill our pastor with the Holy Spirit so he can preach. Then I would notice sometimes in our hymn, it talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you, ladies, that for a long time, I did not know what that was. Even my husband preached on it, and I still didn't quite get it. Now, you probably had an answer like this. I don't know if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Or you would say, definitely not. I don't even know what it is. Some of you would say, I hope so. And some of you would say, I pray for that every day. Now, I want to explain a little bit what this is about today. Now, I do want you to know that I'm not speaking of Pentecostalism today. Now, there is a religion, and my aunt was Pentecostal. I went to her church many times when I was a child. But there are some false teachings there, and one of them happens to be about speaking in tongues, all right? So I am not talking about speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues that was done in Acts chapter 2 was the ability to speak a foreign language. When Peter got up to preach, the people there were from every country around. They had come for a festival day, a feast day, and they did not even understand the Jewish language. And so God gave those uh, disciples the ability to speak a foreign language that they had never learned so they could witness to these people that had come from all over the world. And they were able to do that to spread the gospel. Now, I, I, I believe that is what it was, but I, I'm not referring to that when I talk about being filled with the Spirit, though that sometimes did accompany being filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts. And it's not just for preachers or men. In fact, it's commanded. I, in the old, I should explain something about the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, there were certain men that were filled with the Spirit to do a job for God. All right? I know that Saul was Spirit-filled. I know that David was. I know that some of the prophets were filled with the Holy Spirit. But they were, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not given to everyone. It was given at special times for special purposes. 
But in the New Testament, my husband preached on this the other day, the Holy Spirit is given to every person that asks Jesus Christ to be their Savior. He is given to you the moment you trusted Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says he sealed you with the Holy Spirit. But that's still not what I'm talking about, about being filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is something different. Now, I do believe there was an example in the Old Testament of a Spirit-filled lady. I think it was Deborah. Deborah is in the book of Judges. The Bible says that she would, she was a judge in Israel, and she, people would come to her, men and women, and she would tell them the way God felt about their problems, and she would speak for God to the people there. Now, in the Song of Deborah, it, it calls her a mother in, in Israel. So she was a lady, maybe very much like you and I, Except that God was using her and filling her. I had to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and this happened on the day of Pentecost. If you look at verse 12 of Acts, chapter 2. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. Now, when they heard them talking in other languages that they had never learned, they said, what is this? And they said, oh, they're drunk. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now notice in those last two verses, it mentioned daughters, and it mentioned handmaids. Are those male or female? They're female, aren't they? And Peter said, what is happening right now is that God is pouring out his spirit on all of us, and even the daughters and handmaids were being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, God would give the Spirit to do a certain job. Now, the reason I ask you if you're filled with the Holy Spirit is you need to be filled with the Spirit to do the job that God has given you to do. So we see that in the, on the day of Pentecost. Now, if you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5.18. And I want you to see a verse, and you've probably seen this, maybe even memorized it before, but it's a very important verse. It says in 5.18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Then, these verses go on to say what the wife is supposed to do, what the husband is supposed to do, and what the children are supposed to do. This is an introductory passage to our role as a homemaker. But it says... Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I was from an unsaved family. My parents were not Christians at all. And my dad, to tell you the truth, became an alcoholic. So when I would read this verse, I would know what a drunk person was like. I'll be very honest. My dad was different when he was drunk. 
than when he was sober. I could tell the minute my dad walked in the front door whether he'd been drinking or not. Now, my brother lives in Jackson, Michigan, and he looks like my dad. He's a deacon in a church. He's a very good Christian. And when my dad was not drinking, even though he was unsafe, he was very much like my brother. He was mild-mannered. He was a kind man. He was a smart man. But he became an altogether different person when he was drinking. And some of you know what I'm talking about there. If my dad was drinking a lot of beer, he would get very sentimental and he would start crying about things. If he drank whiskey, he would get mean. I could even tell what my dad had been drinking because when he was drunk, he was an altogether different person than the man that was there before he was drunk. Now that has to do with this verse. It says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What God is pointing out here is that if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be different than just an ordinary Christian. It will show in your life, and people will know that there's something different about you. And the difference is the filling of the Holy Spirit. It will absolutely transform your life in such a way that people will say, you're different from what you used to be. And notice in Ephesians 5.18, this is a command. It's not a suggestion. It says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, it means being surrendered to God and know so that God is filling you in using you. Surrender to God enough so that God is filling you and using you. I know this is a simple illustration and it may not be complete, but it's like this. When I trusted Jesus Christ to be my Savior, the Holy Spirit came into my life. I'm going to give you an illustration about a car, okay? It's like when, when I got saved, it's like I'm driving the car and the Holy Spirit came in and sat in the passenger uh, part of the car. Now, I was still doing the driving, but the Holy Spirit began talking to me and saying, now turn in this corner. No, no, there's a better way. Go this way. And he would be leading me and guiding me. And by the way, the Holy Spirit does do that. He leads and guides you. But, let's suppose I figured this out. The Holy Spirit is a whole lot better driver than I am. And let's suppose I said, Holy Spirit, you come over and drive the car. I'm going to be the passenger. You're a better driver than I am. And he takes the car keys and does the driving. That would be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Letting God completely take over your life so that he's in charge. Let me give you another practical example that, that I understand. Okay? Let's suppose this Holy Spirit is a guest, and you get saved, and it's like the guest comes to live at your house. Do any of you have a guest room, one that you, you keep for company? I wish I did. I always put my own dirty clothes in there. <laughs> but anyway, so here's, here's this um, room, and when I get saved, it's like the Holy Spirit comes to my house and lives in that room. And I give him the keys to the house in case he needs to get in and out. But I say, now, um, don't go into that room, and don't go into that room. That's a junk room. Or maybe I don't say it. Maybe I just never take it there, okay? But being filled with the Holy Spirit is when you hand the keys to the Holy Spirit and you say, Holy Spirit, this whole house is yours. I'm the guest. 
You manage the house. You manage my life. I'm surrendering to you so that you are the boss. Do you understand the difference? Now, some of us have asked the Lord Jesus to come in our heart, and he's the guest in the room. But there are things that are not surrendered in your life so that he's still like the guest. You haven't given him total control of your life. But that helps me to understand what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I said when I started that this is very much like what uh, Brother Ben Geldrin preached to us last night. Would you turn go to Galatians 2.20? This is a little bit different take on this, but I think it's essentially the same thing. Galatians 2.20 says this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I used to wonder, what on earth does this mean when Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ? And then he says, it's not me that lives anymore. It's Christ that lives his life through me. But as I grew in the Lord, I began to understand what this verse means. Being crucified means you're dying to yourself, to your own plans, to your own ambitions. Crucified means dying. Um, other places in the Bible say take up your cross. It doesn't mean take up your burden. It means a cross was for crucifixion. It was death. And when the Bible says take up your cross daily, it means die to yourself and your own ambitions and plans and live for Jesus Christ. Now, this verse here is saying, I don't want to live anymore. Not me. Not Tony Flanders. Please, I'm not thinking about suicide. I'm not thinking about that. I mean spiritually. I don't want it to be my life anymore. I want Jesus to live through me. Several years ago, I was speaking at a ladies' meeting, and it was not too long after I thoroughly understood this. And I remember a lady speaking to me after the service, and she said, you know, you had to say a, a lot of good things, but she said, I especially noticed your face and that Jesus Christ was talking through you. Now, ladies, I was amazed because that's what I prayed for. I pray that it won't be Tony Flanders that lives, but that Jesus Christ will live through me. And I'm telling you, that's what this verse is about. But when the Holy Spirit fills you as a lady, that's what happens. It's no longer the old Tony Flanders that's living the Christian life by trying and trying and trying and trying. It's me dying to myself and saying, Jesus, I don't want to live anymore. I want you to live through me. Do you see the difference? It, it's a big difference. Um, look at John 15, okay? This is a, a different way of, I think, saying the same thing. John 15 is one of my favorite passages. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Here it gives a picture of a branch and a vine attached to it, and the it's bearing fruit because it's attached to the vine. I believe this is a picture of being filled with the Holy Spirit and God using my life to bear fruit. 
Would you turn to John chapter 4? Here's another illustration of, of this. Jesus is talking now to the lady, the woman at the well. And then he says in verse 14, John 4, 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Here is a woman, a wicked woman, that saw Jesus at the well, and he was talking to her about being saved. And he said, basically he was saying, if you will trust me to be your Savior, you'll never be thirsty again. I'll be your satisfaction, and I'll be inside you like a well of water. You know, you ever been really thirsty? I remember being really thirsty. I, I was talking about this the other day. Sometimes we go on foreign trips. And one time we went to Africa. And there's not a lot of refrigeration in Africa. And I began longing for a cold drink of water. That may sound silly. But they don't use ice cubes or anything there, and you can drink warm milk or warm water, or, you know, and they're used to that. When we landed in Detroit after the trip, and we there was a big boy restaurant there, I went in, and it was a very hot day in Michigan, too, and I said, before you bring our food, could you bring me the tallest glass of ice water you got? And she brought me a glass of ice water. I drank it and asked for another one. I, that's what it's like to be thirsty. Now, some of you are like that in your soul. There's something missing, and you don't know what it is. It's Jesus. And he wants to fill your longing for satisfaction. But Jesus said, when I come into your life, I'm like a fountain. I'm like a, a, this water that's inside you. Now turn to John chapter 7. And again, I'm still talking about the same thing. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, here's what Jesus was saying. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like you have a fountain in you that flows, it says, out of your belly and gives water to everybody else. It's like this artesian well inside of you. Have you ever been around somebody that made you feel like you were around Jesus? I have. I have. Or a lady that was, I, I, I considered a good Christian, and I thought, what is it different about her? I could, I could be with her and talk with her all day long. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit, because that's what the Bible says that fountain is. It's this fountain inside that's overflowing. Now, ladies, I did not understand this for most of my Christian life. Even though I used the terminology and I sang the hymns, be filled with the Spirit, I had no idea what it was. Now, it's where God is working through you and you are not operating in the flesh. It's like what Brother Jim said, you become bankrupt to your own self and say there's nothing I have to you to live the Christian life. I need the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, why would you need this? Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute about 
how to, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but why would you need it? Well, in Ephesians, it tells us to be filled with the Spirit, but then it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. How many of you have heard that verse before? How many of you think that's hard to do? Do you ever think, I know better than he does? It is hard to do. You know, God gave us each a mind, and we think, and sometimes we think, well, I'm smarter than he is, and I know how to do figures better than he is, or, oh, you know, we think all these things. But the Bible says we should submit to our husbands, and in another passage it says we should reference our husband. Respect them and reference our husband. Do you know why that's, do you know that that's impossible to do? I asked my husband one day, we had been having some kind of discussion. Sometimes we kid about who's smart and who, you know. We've been having this discussion and I laughingly said, I bet you wish I were a wimpy wife. <laughs> we have a word wimpy out here. <laughs>
Okay. Let's suppose Krista's 10 years old, okay? And she's getting in trouble with her mom. She's not cleaning her room. She's not doing the stuff she's supposed to do. And finally, mom says, hey, I have to talk to Krista. She, yeah, she's giving it to you. And, but, but Mrs. Webster is a Christian mom, and she wants to talk to Krista in the right way. And she wants, she wants it so that, that Krista will understand that she still loves her, but there are some things that need to change. Did you know that you need the Holy Spirit in order to talk to Krista that way? And ladies, some of us have children that are not following the Lord. Now, Krista is, but they're not following the Lord. Or we need to talk to them about cleaning their room and things like that. But it seems like it's going in one ear and out the other. Did you know that you need the Holy Spirit even to deal with your children? What has to happen is that Mrs. Webster needs to have weight to her words so that they affect Krista's heart. You see? Um, thank you. I won't make you do anything else. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'm going to tell a story, uh, Mrs. Van Gilbert, about joy. Uh, the Van Gelders have a very wonderful Christian family. But they had a sister and a sister-in-law that went home to be with the Lord. Not, uh, it's probably about three or four years ago now, right? I went to the funeral. And I sat next to Aunt Eleanor. And as the funeral was starting, Aunt Eleanor, I said, oh, I just love you. I love, by the way, she's one of the people that when I was around, I felt like I was around Jesus. I really did. And uh, as I was sitting there and the funeral was about to start, I said, I just love Joy. And Aunt Eleanor said, well, my brother said that of all the kids, she was the hardest to raise. And my mouth fell open. <laughs> I couldn't believe it because the one I knew, the lady I knew, was the sweetest Christian I knew. Then later, her other brother, Wayne, got up and he told a story. He said, there was a time when Joy was younger that she was rebellious. And she, he said, my mom and dad actually thought of having her go to Colorado and live with an aunt and uncle until she got straightened around. Because she... And, she, and he said as a brother, they would see her being real sweet to company and, and real sweet, but when nobody was around, she was a rebel. And her mom and dad didn't know what to do with her. And older brother Wayne said one day to mom, he said, Mom, you don't need to send Joy away. She needs you. And I don't know what happened, but Miss uh, Wayne and Joy's mother, that, that week, took Joy up to a bedroom, and they spent all day up there with their Bible. And Mrs. Van Gelder and, and Joy talked about the Christian life and talked about this problem. And he said, I don't know what all they talked about, but it changed their life. Joy was never the same again. Am I telling the story right, Mrs. Van Gelder? And when I heard that story, I thought, that's what Aunt Eleanor meant. But you see, a mom with a problem like that has to have the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit giving your words weight so that you can talk. And some of you have rebellious children that are married now. And you would like to talk to them. Can I tell you, you need to surrender your life completely to the Holy Spirit. And then ask for God to give you the words and the verses and, 
even the very thoughts, so you can talk to your children. Another reason you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to work for God. How many of you here would say, I'm a Christian worker? Would you? There are several of you here. When I was a teenager, after I got saved, there was a song called To Be Used of God. To be used of God, to sing, to speak, to pray. To be used of God, to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming fire. To be used of God is my desire. As I grew in the Lord, I wanted God to use me. And I began to think about my life when I got married and when I grew up. And I said, God, I want you to use my life. I want to bring other people to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you something that happened. When I was 16 years old, we had a man... A, a, a young man, a college boy, come home from Bible college at Christmas time, and he was on fire for the Lord. His name was Phil, and we couldn't wait for Phil to get home from college because he was always on fire, and he wanted to take a soul winning. And one January night, he said, okay, all you kids, we're going to go soul winning in Jackson, this Saturday night, you come at 6 o'clock, and I'll give you what you need and take you where you need to go. Well, Phil had an old 40-something car, and it had one of those backs that was like this. This is no kidding. I think we fit about 15 of us in that car. <laughs> and he gave us all tracks, and, and some of us had Bibles, and he said, now, I'm going to drop you off two by two on the corner and in front of the movie house and in front of the bar and in front of the restaurants. And when people come out, you give them a track. And if you can, you try to talk to them about the Lord. I've never done that in my life. And by the way, things were not exactly the way they are now. Things were a little safer in those days. But another girl and I got dropped off in front of the bar. Okay. <laughs> I've never done this before. But I did exactly what Phil said. I had my little New Testament and I had a track. And this one man was coming out of the bar and down toward us. And I gave him the track and I began to talk to him about being saved. And I talked for maybe two or three minutes, and then he put his hand up and he said, Oh, honey. He said, It's way too late for me. It's way too late for me. Now, I knew from my dad that this man was not totally drunk. He was about halfway there. And I said, No, sir, it's not too late. You need Jesus. And I talked to him probably for another ten minutes. And he kept telling me, it's too late for me, honey. It's too late for me. And finally, he went his way. But do you know what God did in my heart that night? I went home and cried over that man. And I thought, that man needs Jesus. I don't know if he ever got saved. I hope he did. But that put a fire in my heart to want to serve the Lord with all my heart. Ladies, to this day, I still want to win souls. I want God to use me. I want my life to affect the lives of other people. But you know what? I need the filling of the Holy Spirit of God to do that. We cannot work for God the way we, He wants us to in our own power, in our own strength. The Bible talks about doing things in the flesh. I want to show you a verse. This, this verse scares me. It's in 2 Corinthians 3. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 3. I'll start with verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some other epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? 
Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. It's talking about the Spirit of God being in our heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now look at verse 6. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now did you notice in that verse it says that the letter of the law kills, but it's the Spirit that gives life. Now ladies, there was a while when I taught in the Christian school and I was not filled with the Holy Spirit. And I felt like I was beating my head against the wall. And did you know, ladies, if you're teaching Sunday school, if you're teaching the Word of God and you are not a spirit-empowered worker, that the letter is killing, not bringing life? And ladies, a lot of Christian workers do that. We work for years, and it's like we're bumping our head against the wall, and we say, what is wrong? What is wrong? The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. If a person in the power of the Holy Spirit has the Word of God and they are speaking it, that gives life. Ladies, have you ever been to a service that you could tell the preacher was preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. How many of you have ever had that? Let me tell you a story. When I was in college, my husband was studying for the ministry, but I was vaccinated. I wasn't reading my Bible like I should. I would do it hit and miss. I wasn't praying as I should. And I knew in my heart that things were getting cold and wrong in my heart. But I was going to service after service, smiling at people, being my husband's wife, but things inside were not right. I knew that I was away from God. One morning, our regular pastor did not speak. He had a guest. His name was John R. Rice. John R. Rice is in heaven now, but he was a man who knew God. And I want to tell you something. The first five minutes that that man was preaching, tears were running down my face. Not because of what he said, but because of who he was. I could tell Jesus was talking to me. He was a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit. And ladies, at the end of that service, I nearly ran down the aisle to get right with God. And it wasn't what he said. It's who he was, and it was the Spirit of God working through him. Have you ever heard a song sung by someone that maybe didn't have all the notes right, but it was a super blessing to your heart? Anybody ever have ever experienced that? I have. What's the difference? They were filled with the Spirit of God, and God was using them. Now, ladies, those of you that are working for God, sometimes we do this and we don't pray over our lesson. We don't pray about the song that we're singing in church. As pastors' wives or leaders, we're just doing things because we've always done them. And we don't feel like we need anything special from God to do it. We've gotten so used to it that we do it almost by rote. It's not supposed to be done that way. We need God's Spirit to fill us and help us. Then, we need God's Spirit, His filling, to win people to Jesus Christ. Now, I want a couple other volunteers, okay? How about an 
Webster's. All right, you come on out. Mrs. Webster will introduce you again. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Webster, Elisha, if you would sit right here. Okay. We've gone out soul winning and we've knocked on Elisha's door. And she said, come on in. So Mrs. Webster, bring your Bible with you. Now in this story, Mrs. Webster is going to be the soul winner. Okay? And Elisha is going to be an unsaved lady. She does, she's not a Christian yet. Okay? This is very poor casting, but I'm going to be the Holy Spirit. Okay? <laughs> All right? Now, let's suppose we've talked about what a pretty house you have and my, uh, we just, we're real glad you let us come in to talk to you. And now, Mrs. Webster is going to try to talk to her about being saved. Do you know the Romans Road? Okay, would you turn to the Romans Road? And now, she's, she has said, Elisha, you need to know the Lord. And I'm going to show you some Bible verses that will tell you how you can know for sure if you're saved. Okay, so she's the unsafe lady, she's the soul winner, I'm the Holy Spirit. Now, don't let anything I say bother you, you just keep talking, okay? Here's the soul winner, and she's going to show Elisha how to be saved, but I'm the Holy Spirit. If Mrs. Webster is filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what's supposed to happen, okay? You talk to Elisha.
and she had geese, and they were running around the yard, and they would always chase me. That's what I remember. <laughs> but I would knock on the door, and she had a gate out in front. And she would come maybe two or three steps down from the, the door, and I would talk to her, yeah, maybe I'll come to church. And I would try to give her a track and try to talk to her about being saved. And she didn't want anything to do with it, really. It was like, oh, hum. And I would go back. But all my calls were like that. Nobody wanted to listen. I told my husband, I said, honey, I've been going for many, many weeks now soul winning, and nothing is happening. Nothing. And he said, you need to pray about that. And I did. And he said, pray about it some more. And he still gave me Florence's name and other people, and they were still the same. About that time, we had a preacher come to our church named Pete Rice. And one evening, he preached on being filled with the Holy Spirit. I went to the altar and said, Lord, I don't completely understand this. But I know I need it. I know I am failing in my Christian life and in my soul winning. Please help me. That was Monday night. And I prayed about that for several days in a row. And I asked God. I surrendered my whole heart to God. I got every bit of sin out of my life and heart. And I went soul winning. And a lady went with me named Margie, and we had several calls, and the closest call was Florence. And this was after I had prayed for many days about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We went to Florence's house, and Florence came out to meet us at the gate, and she said, come in, come in. I went, do you want a cup of tea? I said, oh, sure, sure. So Margie and I went in, and she sat me down at a table with her daughter-in-law, who was visiting from South Carolina. And, she, and I began to talk to them both about being saved. And Florence said, I am a Christian. She said, I'm a Christian. But she said, would you talk to, and I forgot her name, I think it might have been Deborah. And I talked to Deborah about being saved, and she cried big old tears. Not that you have to cry in order to be saved. And she, it was like she was just waiting to get saved. And she bowed her head and sincerely asked Jesus Christ to come into her heart and life. And when I got done, I showed her a couple more verses. And I said, you know, we have a church just down the road. Would you come to church on Sunday and let people know that you've been saved? And would you consider getting baptized? And she said, I certainly would. Now, baptism doesn't save you, ladies, but it is the first step after you get saved. And do you know, she did come that next Sunday and made a public profession of her faith, and that evening got, got baptized. Well, we were still at her house, and we went out to the car, and I was so happy. I was just praising the Lord. But it was 10.30, and we didn't have to be back until 12 o'clock. So we went all the way to the other side of the county to another call we had. And it was a man and woman, probably about my age. Right? I thought they were old then, but <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> but they were standing out in a horse path. And Margie and I began talking to them about the Lord and about being saved. And both of them looked at me and they said, Mrs. Flanders, we are both Christians. And then they began to cry. They honestly did. And they said, we are so backslidden. We have not been in church in years and we're just far away from God. And I showed them 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And they bowed their head, and both of them got right with God out in the horse pasture. And when they got done, I said, did you ever have a church that you went to? And they said, well, we used to go to Fostoria Baptist Church. That's a pretty good church, isn't it? That was an excellent church. 
And I said, would you go this Sunday and would you go forward at the invitation and tell the preacher that you've gotten right with God? And then would you follow the Lord and go to church? And they said, we will. And I checked up on them. They did that. They were both in church until they died. Now, ladies, I'm not saying that being filled with the Spirit is magic and that everybody you talk to will get saved because people have a will. They can say no, even if the Holy Spirit presses them. But I am saying it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Now, I'm almost done. If you wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what should you do? All right? Number one, have a daily time of prayer. I hope you do that anyway. But have a daily time of prayer. Number two, confess all known sin. Maybe the day before you had an argument with somebody and, and you know that you didn't react in the right way. Maybe you said something to your husband that was just not right. Maybe it was worse than that. Confess any sin that's between you and God and completely surrender to it. That's number three. Surrender all of your life to him. Every day. Number four. Ask for Christ's life to be lived through you. Ask for Christ's life to be lived through you. Ladies, I did that this morning. I said, Lord, I can't live this life myself. Would you live your life through me? Number five. Die to your own plans and your own life. Die to your own plans and your own life. Number six. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask Him. Say, Lord, I can't do this by myself. Would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? Ask to be filled. Number seven, look for ways to be used. As your day goes on, see what happens in your life and see if the Lord sends somebody, it might be another Christian, your way. Ask for opportunities for the Lord to use you. And number eight, claim it. Claim it. You think there's such a thing as asking and asking and then wondering if he did. And we need to just claim it. If we have done what God wants us to do, we need to assume that he has filled us with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Now, let me ask the question I ask at the beginning of the talk. Are you a spirit-filled woman? That's my answer. Dear Lord, thank you for the kind attention of these ladies. Thank you for their thoughtfulness in having this brunch and their complete attention while it was going on. Now, Lord, I ask the Holy Spirit to work now and pray you would use this time. With your head still bowed and no one looking, would someone say to me, Mrs. Flanders, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just lift your hands? I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. All right. Please do those things that I ask you to do. Surrender your life to Him. Now that may take a while, ladies. We may need to sit down at home and say, is there anything in my life that is not surrendered to God? And some of us will find some things that way. Totally surrender yourself to God and ask Him to fill you and use you. Now before I'm finished, is there a lady that would say, Mrs. Flanders, I don't think I'm a Christian yet. 
I've never had a time when I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and life. But I want to. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want Jesus in my life. And I think I'm ready to receive him. Is there somebody that would say, Mrs. Flanders, pray for me. I would like to be a Christian. Would you let me? Lord, thank you for our time together. And Lord, if there is someone that is not a Christian yet, I pray that you would help them soon to find you. Lord, there are ladies in this room that could show them out of the Bible how to be saved. And Lord, would you use us, and would you use us in a better way than you ever have before by filling us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.